So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, so what I will do is uh, really giving you a uh, not Air Canada transatlantic flight, but uh, not a LIDAR flight that I'll show you later, but in between. So we'll be uh, just doing the uh, Air Canada Jazz, if you want, <laughs> type of flight, <laughs> of uh, different projects that have been uh, either PI or involved uh, since um, around 2001, 2000-2001, uh, uh, that are kind of building up and are continuing, in fact, right now. Uh, and as we said, that uh, include communities, different communities, uh, some are biological, some are human, and uh, to show you a little bit some of the challenges that we have in Atlantic Canada right now. So what I'll talk about first is uh, what do we expect for, the, uh, for Atlantic Canada in terms of climate change? Uh, and I had the fortunate uh, uh, opportunity to uh, be uh, the lead author of the, uh, the Atlantic chapter for the last uh, climate change assessment for Canada. So that uh, certainly helped a lot to put all the, the concept and what's happening there uh, for the, all the Atlantic Canada. Then I'll talk a bit more about the coastal ecosystem, what they are, but also what we have to expect, what kind of impact we're seeing. Uh, then we'll be we're talking about the First Nation and more, spe more specifically about Elsie Puktuk, which is uh, Mi'kmaq uh, First Nation in the coastal community uh, in uh, New Brunswick. I'll be just uh, brushing a little bit about the lobster uh, because we have, I've been part of the Atlantic Lobster Sustainability Foundation uh, since its uh, creation in, in around 2007-8. And uh, I've been working uh, with fishermen trying to be better understand what's happening and how climate change is going to impact. And you'll see it's a little bit more complicated than expected. And finally, I'll be talking about uh, the large project that we currently have in which I'm in the co-direction uh, committee, uh, which is uh, on uh, coastal community challenges. So, as I said, uh, in uh, 2004, I was invited to be the lead author. My co-lead author was uh, Norm Caddo at Memorial University. Uh, we had several contributors, like uh, IPCC, like, because it's the same process. Uh, a lot of contributors, a lot of people being involved, because you have to get information of all different components, uh, which is great, but complicated at the same time. Uh, it was peer review after by the policymakers as well as the scientific community, so it's also a big mess at the end to try to put that together, but uh, it was certainly a great experience. So what did we find out in terms of uh, Atlantic Canada? The scenarios are showing that uh, the, and it's already happening, uh, longer, hotter and drier summers, um, which is good in some places because it increases agriculture, and I should say many farmers are very happy about that. Uh, however, and, and I should say tourism is also very happy, especially when you have nice beaches. But at the same time, there are other components that uh, brings more pests, so forestry is having other issues related to that. Uh, increased thunderstorm and lightning activities. Uh, when you have a dry summer and lightning in the woods, it's not good. So these are the type of uh, components that they were concerned about. Uh, increased storm activities, and I will be talking quite a lot about that component, especially on the coast, because this is where the damage are the most severe. Uh, more wind, spring, uh, more winter and spring precipitation, especially in terms of rain. So rain event, which are were not very frequent before in the winter, are coming more and more frequent. Uh, another part is stronger winds, and stronger winds have a huge impact on coastal communities and especially fishermen. Variable and reduced snow cover, except this year, I have to admit, uh, that they have a lot more snow than expected, uh, but uh, that happens, it's normal, Very, the anomalies are the normal uh, changes of the weather. And finally, what we call more anomalous uh, events, so extreme events. And most of the ch extreme events are related to the ocean uh, in terms of hurricanes, mostly, tropical storm, uh, which has officially increased in uh, frequency over the past uh, decade. 
Uh, one that was interesting is decreased fog. And people may probably scratch their head, but it was very good news for Halifax and St. John's because often they have their flight grounded because they cannot land or they cannot go up. So that was something that they were quite happy about. Uh, one big factor for coastal communities that we had to, uh, and it didn't take five seconds to realize the importance, uh, is what we call sea level rise and storm surges. So what you have on this slide here, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a photo from an ARCAN that uh, we received, and this is an archaeologist. Uh, this is a dry dock at the, the fortress of Whispoor in uh, Nova Scotia and Cape Breton. And uh, as you can see, the first line, 1743, this is where was the high tide. And this is the, the anchor that he's using, this is where they were attaching the boats. The same space now, because they have put a wall to be able to do the excavation, the 1998 high tide level, as you can see, is around 1.2 meters higher than what it was before. Uh, so it's very obvious that conditions are changing dramatically on the coast. Another problem that we have, as you can imagine, is storm surges. And storm surges are coming with hurricane and a tropical storm. They bring a lot of wind, a lot of waves and usually will cause a lot of problems of erosion, and that's another issue uh, in this uh, region. One thing that is uh, important to know about with uh, sea level rise is that it's quite a complex uh, phenomenon. Uh, often people think about uh, sea level rise, just the seas increasing and that's it. But it's more complex because, in fact, the continent right now is still rebounding from the last glaciation. So what's happening is that when we had the glaciation, the edge were higher and the middle was lower. Now, here in this region, we're still rebounding, going up. And it helps, in fact, to reduce the level in the water in the Great Lakes. But in the edge, they are going down. So they are sinking, if you want. Okay, this is what we call the vertical motion here. And it's quite important when you think about that, because in 100 years, we're talking about 6 to 15 centimeters. And this is vertical, okay? But vertical, when you have a coast that is pretty flat, it means that the water can go in pretty far, okay? So that's one part. And on top of that, uh, we have the issue of sea level rise, okay? Which, at that point, it means with the glacier, with uh, the, the ice caps melting, we have an increase in uh, water in, in the ocean in general. So when you do the addition of the two, you can see that it's quite big. So if we look, for example, at Skunak and Kujukwak, which are more northern New Brunswick, we're talking here between around 56, 58 centimeters in 100 years in terms of increase of water. But this is vertical. So vertical means inside quite far, okay? The same way if we go towards Cap Jerime, which is close to the uh, Confederation Bridge for PEI, at that point, we're talking more towards 70, 75 centimeters. Uh, you can see why there have been a lot of debate related to that bridge in function of climate change, because it's quite significant when you look at these numbers. The erosion problem is uh, with compound with sea level rise means also that the coast is regressing. There's less and less coast. So this is a picture in St. Peter's in uh, PEI where uh, you can see the first yellow and green line. That was where was the land, okay, not the beach, the land in 1968. Gradually, you can see in 1981 where it was, and by 1990 uh, where this was. The, the uh, 1999, by that point, this house, the well was here in the beach zone, okay? Uh, now, this house doesn't exist anymore. Uh, <laughs> not even it would have been uh, sleeping in the water. So. These are the kind of situation that we see. And I remember driving to Buktush once, 
uh, with a friend of mine who had lived there all her life. And uh, at one point I said, you know, and this was the beginning when I was there, and I said, the houses look weird on the side of the street because they don't have a very nice face to look at. And she said, the road has been moved from around 10 years ago because it was in the water. So this is something that they do very often, uh, is they have to move gradually the road because of erosion and uh, sea level rise. So they already experience these kind of problems. Uh, talk, talking about Buktush, Buktush uh, is a very uh, touristic, highly touristic at attraction for New Brunswick. Uh, you have what we call the Irving Eco Center. They have an interpretation of what is a sand dune ecosystem, what it looks like. And the reason is that Buktush has been bound by the fa Irving family uh, to be able to be protected for life because it was uh, used and abused, I would say, by ATVs and stuff, and they wanted to protect it. Uh, it's one of the large, largest uh, sand pits that we have in the Norton Berlin Strait. So what happened is that there has been a lot of studies around there, and that was part of another pro project that I will be talking a little bit later, uh, in which we were able to measure the changes in several of these uh, ecosystems. And this is, uh, again, from uh, Don Forbes, who, who uh, was working at uh, Natural Resource Canada until uh, the summer, just took retirement. Uh, but what he did is a profile of the dune and see how dynamic this system and how fragile this system is. So what you have here, you have two points, okay, and these are the two points here. And what you have in uh, green is what was the survey, so the elevation of the dune in 2003. And the red line is what you have in 2004. In 2003, we had this... <laughs> one among many, storm in the summer, which quite affected the dune. And in fact, we had a breach a bit further up, uh, which was uh, a bit of a problem when you have to travel between the places. But what you can see here is that the sand was up here and then moved down at this level. And talking to the community and the people who lived there for all their life, they were telling us that the dune was three, four times higher around the 1970s than what it is now. So it's flattening up gradually, uh, and the erosion means that it's thinner and thinner, and we have breach in different places, meaning that uh, it's getting dissolved gradually. Um, problem with that is uh, we have some rare species on these uh, sand dunes, which are already endangered, and I'll be, I'll be mentioning about one a bit later, uh, which I think we're getting towards a dead end, unfortunately. Just to give you the, uh, what it looks like when you have a sand dune and a storm, this is not a good mating. Uh, we start, this is the storm of 2000, which I will be talking quite a lot because that was one of the 100 year storm, which has come back a few times since, but the <laughs> more than 100. Uh, but it has a big impact. And this is a picture of the summer before, and you can see the boardwalk that was all built, and there's nice beaches there, so people love going there. The water is warm, it's one of the warmest water that you can find in Atlantic Canada. So this is why there's a lot of tourists going there. But then uh, we have the famous storm in October 2000. Uh, and this is the day after the storm. A big part of the boardwalk disappeared. Uh, it cost around a million dollars for the Irving family to rebuild uh, part of the boardwalk. But as you can see here is where the water is compared to what you have before. Uh, I should say we had had uh, another storm, Gustav, in 2000. Two, we had another one in 2003, another one in 2000, Boxing Day 2006, another one in 2009, another one in 2010. The boardwalk is not there anymore. It has been moved in the interior of the dune because <laughs> they gave up after rebuilding four times. Uh, it's quite expensive to do that. So as you can see, one storm can have a huge economic impact on the community when you have to rebuild your infrastructure from scratch each time. 
Another place where, fortunately, uh, sea level rise is affecting quite dramatically what's happening are salt marshes. Salt marshes are ecosystem quite diversified uh, in terms of plants, but also in terms of birds, especially waterfall, uh, and some other animals. And they are very important in terms of, a little bit like the mangroves that we were talking before, uh, in terms of kind of buffering storms for the rest of uh, the interior of so the, the forest and communities, etc. Unfortunately, uh, until um, 2008, there was no law uh, forbidding people to build on salt marshes in most Atlantic Canada. New Brunswick has a new policy that forbid people to do it, but be people were doing it until the last second. Uh, you know, feeling the, land, the, the salt marshes to be able to have their house directly on the water. Uh, big problem because many of them cannot get insurance anymore, but they love it. Uh, the problem with that is that these salt marshes are becoming very rare. So we work with uh, Kujibukwak National Park um, because they had done a survey in 1974 and we redid the survey in 2002-2003. Uh, I should say I was just on the phone before coming here uh, with New Brunswick, and uh, if everything goes well, it's always funding it, independent, uh, is uh, we will probably resurvey this year again these same marshes. So what we did is we look at the same march, we use uh, the same technique, a sampling technique, to see what was happening. So the results showed us that the zone that we characterized in 19, that were characterized in 1974 uh, are still present in 2002, but one but is that they were narrower. So they were getting narrow. So they had the a zone with the Spartina tenifolia, which was probably 100 meters before it went down to around 75 meters. So they were all getting short, narrower uh, everywhere. The domination of the species were relatively the same with Jonkis, with Spartina, uh, but what was interesting, and especially in the Carex zone, the last zone, is that we started having also forest species, like Trantalis. What is interesting is uh, it seems that the forest is having pressure on one side, there's a bit some pressure on the marshes, so there's a clash that was not there before between the two ecosystems. And unfortunately, uh, the richness of the ecosystem is going down. We went from 68 species in 74 to 56 species in 2002-2003. Uh, uh, one thing to be, uh, that I forgot to, to put here is that on, among the 56, we have more exotic species than we used to have in 74. So there's also this issue of uh, invasion that uh, is also crippling in these uh, type of ecosystem. So as you can see in terms of potential impact, we're talking erosion, we're talking storm surges, so it has several effects because it brings more salt water in a system that is usually brackish as the maximum. So when you put salt water, some of these species cannot survive. Uh, there's a question also that we have less and less ice cover on the ocean in the winter. So you have more ice that at that point with the wind come and will abrase if you want this vegetation. So uh, it tends to also damage quite a lot and increase erosion. Uh, so biodiversity is changing and that with species distribution also changing. It's kind of changing also the dynamic of the community. So it's a question now to know how this ecosystem will evolve. Will it be capable of continue to protect what are the other ecosystems in the interior? And that's a big question uh, for many uh, people, and especially, in fact, for First Nations. The uh, Mi'kmaq communities uh, in the Atlantic Canada, and I will be talking about El Sipuktuk because uh, the, the, their community is just beside Kujukwak National Park in the Rishibutu River, just at the entrance of the Rishibutu River beside the park, is that traditionally these communities used to be coastal in summertime and then move in the interior, in the woods, in the winter to be protected. They understood very well the system 
of moving in function of the weather, which they cannot do anymore because with uh, the Treaty Act, they have their own reserve and they stay there. And in their case, it's a really uh, high pressure because they are just at the edge of Rishibuktu village, which the population is slightly increasing right now, so they try to do new development. So you can see a little bit of the clash between the, the two communities. But one thing that came up very quickly talking to El Sipoktuk, and they came uh, to the table very quickly, um, is they wanted to know, but what do we have to expect, especially knowing the salt, because they came to uh, some of the presentation we did on the salt marshes, what do we expect for our traditional plants? Because we have a lot of traditional plants in these salt marshes that we're using, especially for medical purposes. One of them is very symbolic, is sweet grass. But they have also others that I will show you in a few seconds that are very important. <coughs> so they wanted to understand, but what do we have to do? How can we adapt? How can we move ahead in protecting these species? Because we're talking about the disappearance of their own social, cultural livelihood and heritage if they are losing a lot of these things. So sweet grass, as I said, it's very important for them. They used to, and traditionally, uh, Mi'kmaq will use mostly the sweet grass that comes from the coastline, from the marshes. So that was one thing. But there are a couple of, of the others that they use, like uh, sea milkworth and the spike grass. There are two others that I cannot name, but that we did a study, but uh, are under uh, privacy for them because they are really potent, and they didn't want anybody to know about them. What? <laughs> and, <it's laughs> pretty, and, I, and we have to respect their conditions on that one. Uh, so what we did is uh, it was part of a large project that uh, we had, as I said, in around 2000. I was uh, invited to be part of a large team. Uh, we were around 25, 30 researchers uh, who prepared a large project for the Climate Change Action Fund of the uh, Natural Resource Canada uh, system. And um, we got $2 million initially, and gradually all of us went and got more money at different places. So by the end, it was a several million dollar project in which we wanted to use a new technology to be able to better understand what is the dynamic of the coastal, coastal ecosystem and how can we integrate. So we had engineers, I was biologists, uh, but we had sociologists, we had economists, we had geomorphologists, uh, we had geographer, we had uh, uh, climatologists. Uh, so we had a very large group uh, of people. And what we wanted to know is how can we use this technology, which is LIDAR, it's a laser uh, system that helps to find the, the precision, uh, very high precision, the elevation of the coast, and how can we use that to better predict what could happen in these communities, in these coastal communities in terms of uh, scenario of flooding, scenario of sea level rise, uh, how is it going to impact their livelihood, how is it going to impact their planning, how is it going to impact uh, if they have infrastructure in this zone. But First Nation, it was how is it going to impact, when, when do we have to expect that the population that we're using of sweet grass are going to be in the water? These kind of things. So. This project, which was under the management of Environment Canada, uh, was, uh, so we had this, this system in which the, the box, the laser, is fixed underneath a small plane. In, an, in our case, in fact, we were using a helicopter. Uh, and what it does is it relates to satellites and get the precision of not only the location in terms of lat and long, but in terms of the height of the place, okay? So, and it does that in a beam that goes one after the other in a row along, and you go by row and you come back and you go back, okay? And what it does is gradually, pre once all that is transferred on the GIS uh, computer, 
uh, it prepares what we call a digital innovation model. So we can precisely see how the, the land is in function of the ocean, in function of the rest. You can see all the buildings, how tall the buildings are, all the roads, everything. Um, when we started in uh, the project, the resolution was around between 20 and 30 centimeters. Now, uh, Real Deg, who was, uh, who is retired, has his own company, uh, does a lot of that. The resolution now is seven centimeters. So it's very precise in what they can measure, okay, in terms of elevation and, and everything else. So the scenarios that I showed you before that were plus or minus, you know, 10 centimeters, now they can go a lot further down on that. So, what happened is that one of the first steps, once we have the digital innovation model, we started preparing maps of all the coasts where we did. So it was going from Cape Juriman to Eskimunak. So all the, the New Brunswick coast on the Norton Bellin Strait. And what happened is uh, we, because of the famous 2000 storm, that was, her, if you want her, target point, we wanted to know about what would happen when we start adding the storm plus sea level rise. What do we have to expect? So what you have here is the normal coast, okay, so you can see uh, all what is green would be either dry or close to dry, okay, in normal circumstances. The line that you have, or the, uh, the circle that you have, the, the dark line, the, the black line that you have, is where the water went up with the storm in 2000, okay? So, and you can see especially, we don't have the, I forgot that. <laughs> uh, so if you look, especially in this, uh, what we call Petit Cap, okay? Uh, Petit Cap is, uh, they have quite a lot of nice houses there, uh, so people are always worried about being flooded. Uh, and what you see is the black line is where the flood came during the storm. One point important to uh, understand here is that Pit Cap was in fact disconnected from the mainland during the storm. They didn't have any more connection. So the water, there was water on the road, cannot get out of there. So that's one thing that's happening. So what was the next step is to add to it, what would happen if we had a sea level rise of 50 centimeters, which if you realize is the lowest end, okay? So if we had, you can see the red line, this is where would be at that point uh, the next plot. And if we take the 70 centimeters, which they are closer to in one way, plus a storm, you can see that would be the white component. So by the end you have around probably close to half of the houses, if not more, that would be underwater. So what happened is our economists and the team started to work on crunching numbers and see that how much would it cost in terms of damage and the, for the infrastructure, how much would it cost in terms of insurance, etc. So these are the type of maps that were done and have been used and we still continue to use them. Uh, in fact, they're getting even more precise now to see, but what do we have to expect? So going back to Elsie Booktook, they wanted to know about what will happen to our communities. Our sweet grass and all these uh, medicinal plants, we want to know. Most of them are in Kujibquak National Park because they have a traditional burial ground, they have different things there, so they wanted to know. So uh, we went out and I had the student helping on that. Uh, who we walked with them all the co all the coast <laughs> quite a long walk uh, to be able to map precisely where were all these populations. <coughs> so all the red dots that you have here are all the uh, dots of uh, all, each of them represent a population of sweet grass that they either knew or the, we discovered some of them because they, you know, they don't necessarily walk all the time all the place, so that was something that we did. 
I will focus on the, the, the greener part because the green part is in fact where we have the LIDAR. For, for Kujibukuak, we ran out of money at one point. We weren't <laughs> able to do the, the full thing. So this is why there's a part that is white because we weren't able to go further uh, with this one. Oh, thank you very much. So what I'll do is I will be focusing especially in this area here uh, where we had quite a lot of these, uh, these populations. So the first thing was to see about what would happen again with the famous storm of 2, 2.5 uh, meters, because it went up to around 2.5 meters, that storm, the October storm towards Kujimkwa, so we used that level. And uh, you can see here, these are the, that would have been the land normally, that would have walked <laughs> without being wet. Uh, but these are the, the population and this is where it would happen if we had the, uh, the, the, a, a storm of around 2.5 uh, meters. So all these populations would be underwater. We did the same also with uh, 3.5 meters. Okay? And you can see at this point that they are really underwater. Uh, yeah. You could expect that they would be there for an extended period of time. The problem with many of these species, if they are under water, because it's salt water, on for a long extended period of time, often they don't survive, unfortunately. And again, these are the lines. This is what it would have been with just a storm, what would have been with a 50 centimeters increase, and what would be with a, uh, a 70 centimeters increase in sea level rise. So it has a huge importance for the, uh, for the Mi'kmaq to know what to do. Um, they were a little bit concerned. We did a lot of talking circle after that to discuss what are the possibilities. Uh, because it has a big impact. For the chief, it was especially a concern for, for what they call socioeconomic cohesion of the community. Uh, they were thinking about moving some of these sweet grass population higher ground to make sure that there will be at least a few that will survive. Uh, they even wanted at one point to move the uh, human infrastructure, and this one was kind of uh, a little bit funny because um, the chief, uh, his niece, had his, her house just across the street on the side where one of the population was. So he thought, well, if we move the house on the other side of the street, that will give a bit some room for the species to be able to grow for a while until it reached the road. So that was, you know, they were trying to figure out ways to be able to uh, change uh, the system. Um, they were thinking about some changes in community activities. Uh, when we left, when we finished that project, I should say they were able to get a second project by themselves uh, to look more at the health issues related to having these changes on their coastal uh, zone and ecosystem. So uh, that was something that uh, they wanted to know uh, way more and understand. Uh, in November, I learned that uh, some of these First Nations now have been able to get federal money to uh, increase the height of their roads so that they can pass because uh, close to Petit Cap, there's another uh, uh, kind of peninsula the same way where you have the First Nation uh, community and they knew that they would be cut gradually from the mainland. So they are trying to work on these kind of components. Now the other issues, uh, and we can't talk about coastal communities without talking about oceans. And uh, in the case of, um, of uh, Atlantic Canada, one thing that we know, and now we know for sure, uh, is changes in sea level, in sea surface temperature. Sea surface temperature in the Nautrobelland Strait, we had a report last fall that officially has, over the last 30 years, increased by 2 degrees Celsius. But 2 degrees Celsius in an ocean, it's huge, okay? So we have to think in, in terms of uh, what does it mean for the species living in it, okay? Uh, sea level uh, rise is still another issue. Uh, ice cover because in the Nautrobelland Strait now, uh, many years, they have less and less high uh, ice cover, which means that when you have large, very big waves, you finish by having all the ice building up and uh, yeah, getting in your neighborhood, the house, and uh, 
it's not really uh, safe. So some of the houses, as I said, no more insurance, but also not a possibility in some cases to rebuild at the same place. Um, other issues is also, and um, this is one that uh, is relatively new, There's, we still don't know too much about it, is the question of ocean acidification. So as I said, I'm part of the Atlantic Lobster Sustainability Foundation, and one thing that we have been trying to, uh, to work on uh, in the past, uh, I should say, year and a half, is how is this all connected? Because ocean acidification, sea surface temperature increase, all these conditions are increasing uh, the threat that you have to seafood and fish. And it, lobster is uh, certainly highly susceptible because, as you can imagine, its carapace needs uh, calcium. So if you acidify your system, it's not good for this kind of uh, of invertebrates. So what I've been doing is uh, working especially through literature review and talking also to the fishermen. Uh, I've been starting to put the model together, which we have to go by step. There are many more steps to go for, uh, to look at what are the compos components that we have and what do we have to start thinking about when we look at coastal communities that are, in some cases, based on the survival of the lobster to survive themselves, and how is it going to work? So this is just a component here uh, where we have a lobster. And when we talk about climate change, we cannot stop uh, just at this level. We have to look at, for example, the North American oscillation, because this is a factor that will, influence, will be influenced by climate change and will influence also climate change in terms of what's happening in terms of sea, sea surface temperature acidification, storm searches, human activities are doing that, but we have also a lot of internal variation within the NAO, uh, as well as we have an, an impact on the current. So all these components are going to affect the lobster on one side. But on the other side, we have also environmental pollution that is coming, especially, and this was especially for the Northern Berlin Strait. We have now in the Northern Berlin Strait several spots that we call anoxic, so there's no more oxygen. And the main reason is that the, the strait is getting uh, eutrophied gradually. It means that it's getting a lot more environmental pollution, including uh, coming from inland uh, industry, coastal development. Agricultural runoff is a big problem, especially with the potato agriculture in PEI, where we have a lot of uh, pesticide going straight in the water. There's a project with Omaris, uh, which is a research institute, looking at the impact of uh, sub-little doses of insecticide on the lobster. It's not pretty. Uh, deforestation. So we have all this issue of eutrophication. So all these components are getting together. But when you look at the human side in terms of the fisheries, you can see that you have a lot more to look at because you have also uh, ground fish harvests, which are reducing predation on, on, on the lobster, but the lobster needs also the fish to eat. So there's this connection here. Uh, the number of lobster are getting impacted these days, as, as you probably know, and the crisis that exists now in the, the Maritimes on that. But that changed also the fishing efforts. The fishing efforts, they need more bait, more bait, they need herrings, they need other species like that that cannot survive, so all these components are connected together. So, and it's the same with the fishing communities where we look at the number of people available, the intergenerational uh, issues that are coming, the cultural values, etc. So by the end, the model looks uh, more like this, <laughs> uh, and it's not complete yet, there's still pieces missing, I realize that there's one box that disappeared suddenly, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it's really complex. So when we talk about climate change, this is this part here, but it has a lot of other ramification in terms of impact, social and ecological impact at this point. So the next step in the research on this one is to complete that and gradually be able through uh, what I, we call the Cura CCC, which I will explain in a few seconds, 
uh, try to analyze with our communities, we have 11 communities, and we want to analyze the, what it means for them, how is it going to impact, and how are they going to deal with this? How can they improve their resilience to be able to uh, keep a certain level of sustainability in their, in their communities? So the famous Cura, the large project that we're currently working, uh, it's called the Coastal Community Challenges. Uh, Cura, it means uh, Community Re uh, University Research Alliance. It's a funding from the Social Sciences uh, Research Council of Canada. Uh, this is a little logo, a butterfly, mon monarch butterfly. And the main reason is, was really the monarch effect, the flight effect that we felt that was important here. And many more. If you look at the origin of monarch butterfly and the, uh, the wing effect, you would be surprised how much stuff is related to the ocean. Uh, so what we have in this Cura project, which is a little bit different than many other Cura, is that we have, we all part together uh, around the, over a dozen, like close to probably 20 researchers and uh, another 15 different partners, community partners, is we're doing it, what we call it, longitudinal multi-site project. Longitudinal because we, are, we have started with the storm of t December 2010, and we are now accompanying, if you want, communities, 11 communities in Quebec, New Brunswick, and PEI, and see how it's working. In these 11, six were sinistered during the December 2010 storm, six, five were not. And we wanted to know, are they going to move similarly or differently mm -hmm. towards adaptation and resilience? Because often we believe, and this is what uh, has been a kind of theory uh, between uh, with Katrina uh, in Louisiana, is that you have people moving together only if there is a big storm or if there is a big disaster. So this is something that we're testing through this project. We're using what we call uh, PAR, so participatory action research, uh, in which we uh, integrate local knowledge, scientific knowledge, and we try to co-construct a solution with them on uh, what's happening. At the same time, we're monitoring all the process. And the way that we monitor the process is in terms of performance. There will be some procedural short term, but long term. And what we're trying to look is how can this project and this monitoring can help also influence decision making. And what we did is we dissect, if you want, the concept of resilience of what does it mean for a community, what are the parameters that should be important. And we put it in terms of eight aspects and six dimensions. So the aspects of resilience that we are monitoring is the absorption capacity, the ability to recover, the ability to ad ad of adapting behavior, cap capability of innovation, capability of self-organization, learning process, acceptance and management of risk, and capability of, to anticipate. When we look at the dimension, we're looking at the social, dim social sphere, so the psycho uh, social and the social dimensions, the environmental sphere, so the ecosystem dimension, the economic sphere, as well as the political sphere, which is the government on one side, but the ter territorial governance aspects on the other side. The two sometimes clash quite badly, I have to admit. Uh, we learned that, especially in one of our community. Um, and finally, we, what we want to, from there, is develop uh, using these 48 components, because it's making a grid, okay? Uh, we're trying to vi make a visualization uh, system uh, using the amoeba model. Some, some of you probably are familiar because it's, uh, it's been used, especially in Europe, but uh, uh, it helps to visualize because shorter and contracted is the amoeba, the worse it is, and if it's taking up the space, so that means better it is. And we're trying to look at, and it can also show where are the weakness in your system, in the aspects and the dimension that you have. So this is uh, what we are looking at right now. And through long longitudinal work, it would be possible to see if that amoeba is changing or not. And finally, uh, we have started giving them some tools, uh, and some of the tools that we started with is to try to make them think 
and start to make to have the discussion around vulnerability and resilience, um, and especially trying to tell them why this is important. That's something that we, we realize they are not all at the same level. Many of them have hard time to understand why do we have to do something. The government can do something for us. And that's a very, very common reaction of people. Uh, so one of the tools that I prepared that uh, we have now, uh, I delivered it three, four times now, and we'll deliver it again uh, in the Summer Institute this summer, uh, is a, a tool that goes from vulnerability to resilience. Uh, it's based on, there are many tools, some are very complex, and what we wanted is simplify as much as possible. For a few reasons, we're working uh, uh, by lang well, in fact, three languages because we have the Enigma, French, and uh, Francophone and Anglophone communities. But also, uh, you have to be aware that in some regions of New Brunswick, like the Acadian Peninsula, 46% of people are illiterate. So you cannot start giving uh, a 67-page document complicated from a certain ministry right now that wants to push it, uh, because they cannot even understand the first page. Okay? So this is also something that was very important for us, is to give them a tool that they can use and they can possess and they can do it by themselves. Uh, so it's really community-centered, it's very inclusive, and uh, it recognized that we have to build the capacity at the community, at the local level first. This is what is very important. It's based on several principles, uh, mainly social acceptability, openness, transparency, uh, and trying to be equitable. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, I should say that one of our community is Chipagan, and when they got the scenario for their place, they, the mayor didn't even want first to give the results to the community. Because it's, he knows how scary, and we're not talking 100 years in that case. So this is something that is difficult for them to take. And the model is really an iterative model, so they can always work it. It's not, they don't stop, you know, they make a plan, which happens in many places, they make a plan and that's it, it's done, it's on the shelf, we're fine, we have done it for the <laughs> check. In this case, they really have to reiterate and see how it works and go back and come back and see uh, what else can be done at this point. Uh, so it's really to make them going towards resilience uh, and the ability to manage the risk, adapt it over the long term, and making sure that they secure basic needs and maintain sustainable activities. This is really the goal for these communities. Uh, they have really a lot of very difficult uh, challenges right now. Uh, they're not only climate change, economic, especially the current policies uh, are not helping how they will be able to maintain the sustainability. So I would like to acknowledge, as you can imagine with all these projects, uh, you have to <laughs> acknowledge other people. Uh, in fact, uh, David Nazarel, well, I just talked to him on the phone, this is with who will probably redo uh, Kujibukwak National Park in the Salt Marshes. Uh, and this is, I should say, uh, him there. Uh, they're looking down there. You probably don't see a little white spot. This is a St. Lawrence aster, and that will be probably one of our first uh, species that will officially disappear from the planet from in Canada because it's an endemic of Canada because of climate change. St. Lawrence Aster. Uh, St. for you become Laurentianum. Uh, it's a species, a small species, beautiful, but uh, uh, unfortunately uh, most of the places where we find it uh, in PEI, Quebec and New Brunswick. In fact, New Brunswick, we're pretty sure now we have no more population. Uh, because of what's happening on the coast. Uh, but there was NSERC, uh, there was uh, the World Wildlife Fund, the Irving family, as you can imagine, uh, and um, CCA, CCAF and, and ARCAN, as well as SHRC for all the fundings for these different projects. So, thank you very much. What is that particular Plant there. That one? Thank you. Artemisia. Yeah, and it's, uh, I'm working on it right now because uh, for uh, the uh, biology of Canadian wheat because it's <laughs> one of our luxurious weeds. It's an introduce uh, in, unfortunately, on the sand dunes. 
Uh, but we're, we don't know that much yet on it. Yeah. Any more questions? Richard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you've shown us a very complex model and uh, an interdisciplinary approach to understand the system. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of craving, wondering how are you going to express the results? Because you want to introduce change, you want to try and get people to adapt. <laughs> And you've said that some of the people are not very literate. You've said that some people value native species very highly. How are you going to approach presenting those results? Are you going to use a mixed methods approach where you can combine quantitative and qualitative aspects? And you, you, mean you used the spider diagram, which is quite powerful too, but I didn't see how are you going to convince people to make change. Yeah, the, what we're using is what we call a, uh, a really a participatory approach. So we do a co-construction. So what, what happened is we don't want to give them the solution. We want to work with them to find their solution. Uh, so it's a little bit different. So yes, the, the model, the amoeba bundle helps a lot because you can visualize, but you really need a lot of discussion. It's really uh, through discussion, through work with them, that so there's a huge part that is qualitative. Uh, it's interesting because in the recent month we did quite a big strike in some of them. Uh, one of them is Kokang, who, where uh, they now are officially working on uh, water and food uh, during storm because they realized very quickly. They are disconnected completely from uh, Mountain, which would be the, their hub for, for them if there's a storm. Uh, so what they now are working is using the model, is trying to figure out what they have to do with it. So, and this will be part of the activities this summer, is uh, they want to find their solution. They are now have a lot more people on board than they had before. Uh, so it's not just one little NGO, now it's a lot more in the community it's trying to work together on this. Uh, and by showing them a little bit where they're starting and see where they're, and it's really putting a visioning system at the same time where they want to go, that they find the steps in between. It's the same with Chipagan, they have moved quite a lot. Uh, the mayor is not any more angry to the fact that the, the data will be given to the community. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and in fact, he has struck, and it was interesting because it was kind of a mutual agreement between several groups in the community, the community and the mayor saying, we have to get all together to work on it, uh, which is a big step because these communities used to always say, it's the government will do it. So having this possibility now to move a little bit higher, uh, there's a big difference between Chipag and, Co and Coquin in some way because Coquin is not a municipality. Uh, New Brunswick has this weird thing that uh, some communities are not registered. They are not incorporated. So that's a little bit more tricky because they report straight to nobody. <laughs> that's a little bit more complicated versus in the other, they have a municipal council. So that's... Uh, and, uh, and saint Levy in Quebec is the, the, the one that has been probably the most sinister in all of the one that we have. And uh, finally, last week, I decided to move ahead. So uh, it's really a step-by-step. -step. It's a lot of discussion. Uh, I should say we are quite a lot of people. <laughs> so you're trying to get communities to place value on things that are difficult to get. Yeah. It's pretty much that, and and uh, I should say my experience because I work also with the Greater Sudbury. In fact, my in between <laughs> between all that, uh, I've, I've been uh, I had another in our can project in uh, in, uh, in Greater Sudbury, uh, where in this case we started in 2005. We involved a lot of the community. We had the partners, including the mines, Hydro One, uh, the hospital, the uh, public health unit, uh, the uh, city, the 
a lot of people, this uh, Nickel District Conservation Authority, etc. And what came up from there is the uh, gradually the uh, this Nickel District Conservation Authority look at the report and said we cannot keep that on the shelf. It's not the best thing. So they asked me to prepare a position paper from there, uh, which had very specific recommendations. One of them was the creation of the Climate Change Consortium, which they created in 2009, uh, and it's still working today. In fact, I had a conference call before coming here uh, with them, because we're moving now to, the, to another step, uh, which is, um, you can call it neighbor to neighbor help, uh, because they have a lot of vulnerable people, uh, they already had a few uh, deaths in the past when they had heat waves, uh, tornadoes, or uh, things like that. So they wanted to uh, to start a system, but they, they are initiating by themselves now all these issues one by one, and they go step by step. We cannot try to change a full city in one shot. But uh, for example, the simple thing that they have done. Well, simple, not simple, in <laughs> fact, uh, is that the EMS system was not connected. So the fire department is not connected with the police, is not connected uh, with the ambulance. When there is a drop, uh, somebody drowning in uh, a creek, and they have the Johnson Creek that passed through the city, uh, that each time they have a heavy rain, and heavy rains are coming more frequent, this is their extreme event in their case, and what happened is that when they were calling, most of the time they were sending the ambulance. The ambulance said, no, it's, they have to call the police. They, are, they will have to do the counselor. And uh, they called the police. Finally, nobody had a code to say that there was an emergency because we have an extreme event and we need to evacuate or we need uh, somebody drowning or something like that. So they have started doing uh, different things, uh, including, for example, mapping. Uh, the zones that are at risk of flooding in Sudbury. And over that, they have, what they have done is they put all where are the nursing homes, uh, the, uh, uh, the lower income families, all these things, to try to figure out where do we have to evacuate first if there is a flood. Uh, so that's working. Uh, and now the hospital is also overlapping uh, where are the most frequent um, places where they have to send the emergency the ambulance because of heart attacks. So they now start having all this information. So on top of that, now they want to have this neighbor helping neighbor to be able to see, well, okay, we have a zone where we have a lot of elderly people who will need help. We'll try to find volunteers that will help them to know that if there is a flood, they can evacuate. If there is a big storm, like they have today again, uh, that uh, they can uh, have somebody shovel instead of having a, you know, an 85 year old person uh, having a heart attack because trying to do it by herself or himself, all these kind of things. So they are moving quite rapidly on that. We're still working on it right now. Okay. Uh, 
uh, that's the, the, the most complicated component. <laughs> we, what happened also is that the postdoc that was doing that has now is professor now. So she is preparing a lecture for the first time in her life, and <laughs> so everything has been slowing down a little bit. So that's the. Um, you mentioned in the in the part the richness of species has declined from 68 to 56. And also at the same time, you have more exotic species coming up. I was wondering if any of those um, exotic species have proven to be useful. Uh, we didn't look at usefulness of them necessarily uh, because that was uh, it was more for the part trying to understand what was happening. Uh, and the reason is, as you probably know, the uh, national parks, not only in Canada, everywhere in the world, have their mandate of the college of integrity. So they want to know uh, if farming.
The first thing was for them to realize that we probably need to put new bylaws to stop having the houses being built directly on Parley Beach. Uh, you know, they needed to, to, to learn these kind of things. Uh, and when they start seeing the economic impact, the social impact, the infrastructure impact, this is when they decide, okay, we'll need to do a green plan around the coast, reduce uh, impact there so that we can have that buffer gradually. But it's, it's really a step by step, and it was just one step. Then the next step was to start doing X, Y, Z, and more. Yeah. It's the same with uh, Sudbury. Uh, they did one thing, the EMS was a big thing. A uh, second uh, was the, uh, the flood and where the zones are. Now we're working on the uh, neighbors, helping neighbors. Uh, they already have started to think about the next phase after that. So it's one block that you add at the time. Well, thanks again. Thank you very much. Very interesting speech. I would like to say maybe um, um, coming from uh, the Netherlands, where we're already below sea level. <laughs> 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 we're experts. <laughs> we should uh, get some over here. No, but, uh, I would. I did want to ask how how much of the plans are to use any kind of hard engineering. That's a big controversial uh, issue in many of these communities. And, uh, and in fact, St. Lady was interesting because the first thing they wanted is they wanted their protection wall. Yeah. And that was it. That yeah. was the only thing. And uh, is that when we started showing them the impact, the other issues, uh -huh. and uh, how it works, and uh, that you make a wall there, and the next place there, it's going to be worse. Yeah. Uh, when they start seeing what it meant, yeah. they realize, okay, it's probably not the best solution. Yeah. So, but it's really a um, lot yeah. of discussion. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, thanks again, and mm -hmm. thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.